Hey, how are you all doing? You all right? Yeah, I'm just gonna be comfortable with this mic. Someone on the front row may get splashed if I gesture and knock my glass of water over. Cool. That's my name. Uh, these are some places that you can find me on the internet should you wish to do so. Um, before I start, not to get too depressing too soon, but I should let you know that I reference some difficult stuff in my talk, including child abuse and sexual assault. Uh, I haven't put any jokes in to make up for it either, so we're just going to have to have a sad time. Um, I want to talk to you about the practice of uh, making games in socially engaged settings. Uh, in the arts world, that used to be called community art, uh, but we don't call it that anymore. We call it socially engaged settings because what the fuck is a community anyway? What does that mean today? Um, and I mean, basically, it just means making art and games with people who don't usually make art and games in places where those things are not usually made. I'm going to spend 10 minutes giving you a bit of background on how I work, five minutes particularly describing a specific story game I just finished making called uh, Teviot Tales, which is based on a residency I've just finished on an estate in East London. And then the last five minutes, I'm going to ask the question of both myself and all of us, is this a good idea? So... I just told you what it is. Um, before I start, uh, I sometimes lecture, and I would be remiss if I weren't to say this stuff has been going on for a really long time. People have been making socially engaged art and playful things and games for 150 years, even further if you think about the difference between uh, an artist and uh, a participant and how people have been thinking that over the past uh, I don't know, several centuries. So if you read anything on these subjects, if you are at all interested, uh, please read Critical Play by Mary Flanagan, which is about radical game design, and Artificial Hells by Claire Bishop, which is about the history of uh, participatory art, which, as you imagine, has a crossover with games. Can't recommend those books enough, and that's because I don't have an hour to speak to you and lecture you about how excited I am about the history of this stuff. It exists. Um, so, uh, let's move on. So, what do I do and how do I do it? I often work in socially engaged settings as an artist and game designer in public buildings and places in the streets or rural towns or estates in inner city London. Um, I'm going to give you some examples because that's a much better way of explaining what I do. Uh, so, this was a project called Northern Big Board. I was in residence in a swimming pool in Shipley, which is just outside of Bradford. If you have a sense of England, that's in Yorkshire. It's north-ish. Um, and uh, as part of that, I spent two months speaking to people who used the pool, who worked there, who walked by, about what the place meant to them, memories that are attached to it, that kind of thing. And I made a series of installations um, in reaction to that. Seven installations around the building. Uh, some of them were little stories that you could open a locker and discover and put some headphones and listen to someone talk to you. Uh, I worked with the staff. Uh, there were huge public sector cuts happen at that point in England, and a third of the staff were being cut. And uh, it was a real wound in the community that these people were leaving. And so I worked with them to find a, a story that was sort of important to them about their time there, and we made little plaques and put them in their favourite places around the pool. Uh, the one at the top is again related to the cuts. They were uh, losing their cafe hours and a lot of the older people there told me how important the cafe was to them. It's one of the few places you could still get a cup of tea for under 50p, they said. Um, and so I made a, uh, an interactive piece for two people, gently interactive. You put headphones on, two different stories happen in both of your ears, but between you you're given actions which uh, allow you to make and pour a cup of tea for one another within the space of five minutes. Gentle little things around a building. Um, this is a different thing that I did. It was called Songs for Breaking Britain. I formed a punk band, and uh, me and these two guys, we went out into the streets of the centres of cities around Britain, and we asked people what it meant to them to be British. And out of the answers, we made punk songs. It's part gig, part storytelling. It happens in theatres, but also in underground DIY venues. Uh, and every time it goes to a new city, we collect new stories, and we make a new song about that city, for that city, that we perform at the end of the week. Um, I've developed and used in these two examples a methodology that I call story collection. I collect stories from strangers and I retell them in my work. Sometimes I stand in the street or I sit in a public building, a cafe, but I am always introducing myself to strangers and asking them questions. And it's with the answers that I make stuff. The questions are important though. 
they're the heart of it. They're the thing which I iterate, which I design, which I have to understand how people are going to interact with. I ask questions that everyone is an expert in. Not what's the best song, but what's your favorite song? You can't get that wrong. People are afraid of getting things wrong. Questions that are complex, I approach through definitions and bits. I don't ask what does it mean to be British first off when I meet you, because it doesn't invite you to do new or inventive thinking. I ask, where would you say you're from? What does that mean to you? What are people from here like? What makes you happy? What makes you sad? What would you change if you could? Sometimes those questions, they don't work, they jar, but the silences can tell you as much about a person as the answers, and sometimes little things can spiral off and people will astonish you. Uh, like Steve. I remember his name because he looked a lot like my uncle Steve. I met him in Bradford, the centre of Bradford, by the town hall. And I remember Steve because he looked a lot like my uncle, but a slightly shrunken down version of my uncle, who's also called Steve. Um, I spoke to Steve and he told me how important the dales were to him, the hills around him. He said that there was a coiled spring that always brought him back to that city. And he also um, uh, told me that he was a construction worker and he hadn't got very much work at the moment and he was struggling. Um, as Steve was talking to me, there was a kind of quiet fortitude in him that made me really, and, and the, talking about the hills and stuff as well, it made me picture him as a shepherd. It was a stupid passing thought, and somehow I decided to ask this untested question. I said, I said to him, it was a really stupid question. I said, if you could be anything in any time, if you could do any job in any time, in anywhere in the world, what would you do? Uh, and, and he rightfully replied with silence. Um, but then he started talking a little bit about how he was brought up. Uh, he talked about his uh, mother who used to teach him and his sister how to paint and write poetry when he was little. And I said, what did you used to paint? And he says, well, I still do, actually. I started again maybe uh, a couple of years ago. I was walking past a skip and some people were throwing out a couple of cupboard doors. And I thought, well, that's a waste. So I took them home. And then out of nowhere, I just had some paint and I decided to paint the sky on them. And then he did this a couple more times. Some more cupboard doors were thrown out. He took them home and he painted the sky on them. And he was a military enthusiast, this man. His, his dad and his granddad had been wounded or killed in one of the world wars, both of them, I mean. Um, and he uh, had a lot of aeroplane magazines. He really liked military aircraft. And after a while, after having a mounting a few, you know, 10 or 12 cupboard doors with the sky on them, he suddenly thought, why not paint an aeroplane on as well? So he started painting aeroplanes onto sky, onto the back of old cupboard doors. And his sister came to visit and she said, oh, do you remember when mum used to tell us about um, thinking about where the light is in a picture? So where shadows or reflections and things might be. Uh, and he developed his style. He continued to try and learn. He got a book out of the library. He said to me, I've got over 100 cupboard doors now with paintings of aeroplanes on them. I was thinking of putting them on eBay so someone would see them. People are astonishing. They are hard and beautiful and perfect and broken. They are complicated, so much more complicated than anything we're used to seeing and hearing and reading. Um, I live in London at the moment, and uh, four years ago I moved there. I was working part-time for a game design company uh, called Hide and Seek when I moved, and I couldn't afford the whole journey to work, so I used to get the train to London Bridge and then walk the two miles, about three kilometres, uh, to Farringdon, where the office was. I hadn't lived in a city before. And in the 15 minutes that I walked through the centre of London, I walked past more people than I was used to seeing in a month. And I was exhausted by that. I was exhausted by trying to hold in my head when they moved past me that they were as whole and real and as feeling a person as I was. Uh, there's a guy called McLuhan, um, Marshall McLuhan, who said, or is it Michael? It's one of those two, uh, said that in the electric age, we wear all mankind as our skin. And I believe that we sometimes have to anesthetize ourselves as a survival mechanism. So my story collection, uh, it's, it's work about trying to take the time to feel the weight of others' humanness, their agency. And I'm interested in games as a way of doing that because for me, games are like those questions that we're all an expert in. They give me a framework with which to experience things, to try and understand a story, to approach it from different uh, mechanics or, or directions. 
It can sometimes, a game can sometimes put into a form something we're trying to tell in content. And I come from a theatre background uh, in, for which the maxim of a playwright is show, don't tell. And games can do that magnificently. So, I already did that. Why games? I did that too. Why the fuck not as well? That's the point. Um, I'm now moving on to talk about a, a thing that I've worked on just recently finished, and that's why the talk is called 2010 People. I was just going to call it that, but they said I should probably give more information in the title than that. So, uh, 2010 People. Um, I just make it finished making a game about the Teviot estate. It's called Teviot Tales. It was a commission from the Social Housing Arts Network in association with a housing association called Poplar Harker. I uh, commissioned art in turn from an illustrator I collaborate with quite often called Michael Parkin. Um, the 2010 census tells us this about the Teviot estate. It is inhabited by 2010 people. There are 540 children. 259 of those children live in poverty. 495 of the people who live there are white British. 905 are Asian and 300 are black. After housing costs, the weekly average household income is 270 pounds, which is around 340 euros or 390 US dollars. 67% of the people who live there rent their home. 60% of households own no cars. 33% of the houses are overcrowded. After spending 30 days over eight months on the estate, I can tell you about some of the people behind those numbers. There was Lee, who is a dustman, but he also campaigns against abuse in care homes after being abused as a child. Rachel, a single mum who boxes, she calls herself half East End, half West Indian. Tina, who runs the cafe at a loss because she gives away so much tea and sandwiches to hungry kids and locals down on their luck. Gemma, who complained about the loss of parks. Bernie, who told me about climbing through abandoned houses and broken windows as a little girl. And the two school kids who told me that they missed their friend Amjol, who died on their street from stab wounds. And then there was a ZD. Uh, Azidi has lived in the UK for 15 years. She has a soft voice and much better English than I first thought when I met her in a workshop that I was running for the Teviot Bengali Women's Group. Her headscarf was aqua blue with bright red, yellow, black polka dots. She was a refugee from the 1993 Somalian civil war. She told me she still has backache from when she ran to the bathroom and climbed out of the window, leaving her baby son with her aunt because they wouldn't rape my aunt. She was an old woman. They did kill her, though. Azidi spoke this gently and clearly to me. We left because of the war. They kill your family in front of you. I don't know how much we paid to get out of there. A lot. We were on a boat for four or five days. We have no food or drink. Someone gave me milk for my baby, but the milk was bad and the baby became very ill. They were one of two boats that set off for Kenya, and the other boat sank. All those people died, she said. She explained she was very young at that time, 22. My husband was 10 years older, Ahmed. He was a very nice person. She was so warm when she spoke about Ahmed. She met him on her wedding day. She hadn't met him before that point. She'd seen a photo, though. Her father asked if she would marry him, and she said yes. She said he was so loving, caring. He never went anywhere but with me. When they were in a refugee camp in Holland, um, she found out that her sisters had survived and they were living in London. She described how tirelessly her husband worked to get her reunited with them. Eventually, they got the documents. They travelled over and she was with them again. But two days later, Ahmed died. Um, he, they, they think that he knew that he was ill um, but that he would never have used the last of their money that they needed to get over to England uh, going to hospital. When I lost my husband, she says, with these warm brown eyes, she doesn't cry, I do. I lost nothing. I lost everything. I do what I can to forget him, but I can't. The years pass. I cannot be happy. I would stop wars everywhere if I could. I can't watch TV at the moment. Syria is worse, worse than what we went through. I would give people peace if I could. Those stories are everywhere when you take the time to listen. And um, 
I did. I, I tried to devise a series of ways of collecting stories from the people of that estate. Uh, through workshops and interviews and conversations in the street. Um, they weren't always successful though. I started off by designing a series of workshops, talking to people who worked on the estate with various groups. Um, and I made sure that ones that were for um, young mothers were at times when kids were in Munchkin's playgroup. And I made sure that people, uh, ones aimed at older people, were uh, at a time like sort of just after they might usually go collect their pension according to the post office, that kind of thing. Uh, I designed a whole series of workshops, all of which I, were aimed at different people and used different language and were advertised in different ways. Uh, but no one actually turned up to any of them. Uh, it turned out that um, I discovered, as I spent more time on the estate, that uh, there were a lot of pre-existing groups there. Um, and so what I did instead was I went and I talked to those pre-existing groups and I asked if I could run workshops for them. So I ran Twine game design workshops for elderly IT uh, learners and poetry workshops for Bengali English learning women's groups. Um, the process I'm trying to get across is one of iteration because every place is different. Teviot is a very deprived area, but because it has so much activity, um, they didn't need any new ones. So working with pre-existing activity was the way to get through to them. Um, I wouldn't have learned that without trying. So over 30 days, spent over six months, I gathered around 20 personal detailed stories, around 50 fragments, images, and ideas, and I walked around and I looked a lot. Um, and now, uh, I guess I made a thing. Um, it's launched on the 2nd of May on popularpeople.co.uk, uh, but it's also uh, going to be exhibited, um, which I, I'm supposed to tell you about there, but I think I'll tell you now. Um, it's going to be exhibited in a community centre um, on the estate, and um, it's going to be sort of a, it's, gonna, it's a cur currently a, already a place that people go, but we're just going to kind of build a, a couple of walls on which we're going to put all of the poetry that people wrote and all, I'm going to print out the really simple twine games that we made so people can then sort of understand how twine works when they're playing the thing that I've made. And the twine game itself is going to be in two screens, one facing out through the window and one facing towards you. So the game that's being played will be played for people who are walking by so they might come in. Um, and we're going to build this sort of plinth which will have the computer in it and use a trackpad that we're going to embed in it so that you don't look at it and think that it's a computer game. You look at it and think it's a weird thing. And more people, from my experience, are likely to try a weird thing than they are a computer game, unless you're at a computer games festival, um, which we happen to be. Um, so here are some of the design decisions that I've made. I used Twine particularly because it was quick, it meant I could be reactive. I had a very long process of talking to people but not much time to make a thing. And also because others could learn it, I could offer this to other people. It's now on every single community computer in the estate and there's a, a really simple beginner's guide which is available on every single person's desktop when they log in. Um, what I made reflected my process. I decided that it should feel like wandering. It should feel like the tip of an iceberg, but only that, because there's no real way of knowing a place as a visitor. It sometimes offers you choices, but sometimes you just sit and listen. Characters you hear from the most, they have portraits, which you can look at. It's almost as if you can see them more clearly. Um, you know that I am there. Like all good scientists know that they affect their experiments and I am choosing who to tell you about and I'm choosing how you hear that so you should know that I'm a part of this thing. Um, you should know that the way of looking and talking is me so sometimes I will reflect on things. I'm a part of the game as well. Um, there are statistics you can find, but only a little bit. The history of the place and the shape of the place is there. You sometimes meet barriers, and uh, there's a little reflection on Canary Wharf, and there's a part where you can sit down on a bench and lots of people walk by you. Um, and it's really clear when I'm using people's speech verbatim. There's quotation marks every time someone's saying a thing. Um, so that's the thing that I've made. This is the last bit now where I reflect on um, what I'd say to someone else interested in making a game in a socially engaged setting. Um, oh, that's another picture. I keep on forgetting to do my slides. That's a nice picture of one of the part of the game and what it looks like. Um, so these are the things that I would tell you. Um, first off, like, I haven't put that on there, but why are you going where you're going? Why have you chosen that place? Uh, be really ready to learn about that place and challenge the preconceptions that you have. Know where you are in the work, how you're asking things, how you're affecting it. 
Are you the right person to be asking these questions? Are you the right person to go into this community? And should you instead be training other people with the skills that you have? I, I, there was one point where I tried to um, uh, recruit a fellow community storytelling uh, people and sort of run a series of workshops where they could go out and talk to people in their own language or their next door neighbours in a way that people might not speak to me but again we came up at, against the people don't have much time and why would they anyway problem but have a think about how you do things and when you develop a methodology um, make sure it's right for that place and those people and do develop a methodology a way of uh, giving people a frame a context in which to be heard to speak because we're not used to being articulate every day in our lives people who make things we're used to asking complicated questions and thinking around them but you have to give people a context when they're not practiced in that when they're not exercised in it um, listen to people which is a skill actually ill-practiced in everyday life. And, and just be a good human when you can. Know what maybe you shouldn't include and know when someone may be not able to fully consent to, to even though you've explained it to them. Maybe they have a mental health issue or they are underage or they're talking to you about something they might not have talked about and want to be in a thing, I'd say when you make a game or a piece of interactive art, um, don't make something that you wouldn't be happy for that person to play themselves. Um, so we're nearly at the end, but I feel like I need to ask one last question um, of myself. What do I think now? What have I learned? I think I failed in some ways uh, in this game to, to offer people something in this process um, to offer people something that was something that they wanted to do and I succeeded in realizing that and and reconstructing the process and working with pre-existing groups um, but it was a shorter process because of that um, I hope that I've made a story game that the people who live there would recognize I hope I've made something that might make a player think about a bit about the life of the strangers that they passed by in their daily lives I hope that I've made a place of meeting. But I would be dishonest to say, I would be dishonest if I were to say I think that this is any way righteous. Like a lot of this area is about people wanting to do good, and that's great. I do. I want to do good, but I don't know if these are the kind of things that make the kind of differences that I think are important. I have tried to make my activism my work. I have tried to find ways of working within the system to produce small cracks in it, but I find myself having to collaborate with the UK border agency when I work with people in detention. I find myself working with housing associations who are currently evicting local residents with no good fucking reason. In the UK, the neoliberal construction of art post-Labour government was a kind of productivity, not just in terms of money, tax and income through the creative industries, but also that they, they decided that art was this way of learning, of education and articulacy and generally a kind of social work, producing better citizens. That's why it should be funded, they suggested. We know this argument has rarely reached out as far as games, but the governments agree art should be supported, museums should be free. I make a living, not one with an actual pension or any kind of rights or time off or anything, but I do live off my art. And I believe in art as a way of going, listen or look, a dance between what is and what if, as a way of framing what is and asking, what do we think of this? What if we were to think about it differently? Which sounds very convincing, doesn't it? But it's because I know how to make something sound convincing. You see, my listening to you and my attempt to provide you with a platform for your story, that's only a valuable exchange if you believe in the value of a story. And my problem here is the word value. The idea that they are an instrument, that stories are an instrument, is... It's not about the product, it's about a process. And my process is they're not good enough yet. I take people's stories and I retell them. I ask for their time. I try to offer something. I work hard to run free workshops, to write guides for telling your own stories, to offer others the tools I have, my craft. But these are poorly attended and people are tired, too busy and too poor, too hungry to be 
to, to believe in their own articulacy. Articulacy is a sham. Or rather the idea that we can, in any right way, articulate the world and the way that it breaks us. I've spent almost a decade making work in places with real people that places them at the heart of the process of making it, but I've not got that right yet. I don't even know if this is the right fight. I don't know. And I suppose, if I'm honest, I'd resist the idea that there are hard and fast answers anyway. Mostly, I believe the strongest thing I can do as an artist and a maker is say, I don't know. I close my eyes and I see her brown eyes and polka dot headscarf, his mustard colored flat cap and mirrored aviator sunglasses, his quietly lined face and description of a spring that always brought him back to Bradford, a man dying by the poolside, his first perfect dive. Her mother had suffocated in bed when she went out to buy the milk, moving from Palestine to Barnet and finding yourself evicted from your house. Daniel, who is seven, can repeat the entire arrest speech of a British police officer. Alex looks at me and she describes the cake her friend had brought to the eviction resistance meeting. This is a radical cake, she says. It was better than anything I ever made. <laughs> 